Right, this is the respiratory system. It's chapter 42 mostly. So you can see we've got gills, alveoli, open seals, everyone breathes. Okay, so you can see all the different systems, circulatory, respiratory, excretory. Right here we have an exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide with the blood. And that's really mainly how they go together. So that's how we're doing them together. So the main point for uh, respiration is gas exchange. So it's an oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange um, with the blood and uh, the air that we breathe. So we get that oxygen so that we have our uh, respiration. And it's an exchange between the environment and the cells. So the air that you breathe in and your cells. Um, multicellular, it's a little more complicated because uh, they're not in direct contact with the environment. Um, but Obviously, we're multicellular, so there's a system for that. Two things you absolutely need for a good respiratory system are a moist membrane and high surface area. So it can't be dried out and it can't be small. It's going to have a lot of surface area and be moist. All right, some example of multicellular organisms that are uh, their cells are not in direct contact with the environment, so they have to figure out a different system. Uh, segmented worms, they do gas exchange directly through the skin. Uh, insects, they have tubes called trachea, and uh, air comes in through something called spiracles. They're little tiny openings. I'll have a picture of that later. And uh, vertebrates use lungs and gills. So, for example, fish have countercurrent exchange where they transfer oxygen from the water to their blood. All right, to optimize that gas exchange, the two things you need, that moist membrane and high surface area. Why do you need the high surface area? Um, well, it maximizes the rate of gas exchange, um, and carbon dioxide and oxygen move across the membrane di by diffusion, and the rate of diffusion is directly proportional to the amount of surface area. So more surface area, more diffusion, better gas exchange. Why do you need a moist membrane? The moisture uh, keeps the cell membrane structure intact and gases diffuse only if they are dissolved in water. So if there's no water, there's no gases diffusing. Here are many examples of gas exchange. So you can have our little one cell, it's got little cilia, and directly with its aquatic environment um, it takes in oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide. Here's our insect. This is a spiracle, that little opening, and these are trachea tubes. So the carbon dioxide comes up, the oxygen goes in and into um, the organism. Amphibians, they've got their epidermis and their blood vessels are right up next to their skin. So um, it actually kind of works similarly to the one celled, doing the diffusion right in here. Um, and in the fish, it's a very similar kind of an idea, uh, but they have their gill system. So that's how the water comes in and goes out. So they take the oxygen out of it and give off carbon dioxide. Um, echinoderms have this epidermis. Uh, they do an exchange right in here. And then mammals have things like alveoli, and we'll talk more about that. All right, so uh, different things have different gas exchange structures. Aquatic organisms have external systems that have a lot of surface area, um, but they're in an aquatic environment, so they don't have to worry about keeping it moist. Um, whereas terrestrial organisms, they have a really moist internal respiratory system that has a lot of surface area. So they both have lots of surface area, but uh, aquatic organisms, it's on the outside, and terrestrial is on the inside. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about that countercurrent exchange system. So here's some gills. You can actually see the gills here, and they're red uh, because of blood flow uh, in the gills. Um, so you'll see this is kind of their heart. Um, it's a really interesting system. So this is deoxygenated blood, where it's blue, and then red is once it gets oxygen. So it pulls oxygen from the water, and then it um, gives it off to the rest of the system and it becomes deoxygenated again. So how it works is the fish is swimming, the water flows through, 
flow straight through the gills, flows through these gill filaments, and there's um, it's a blood vessel. Okay, now looking at this smaller part, how it works, uh, the water flows over um, this lamellae, and the blood is flowing this direction, so it's deoxygenated here, and then it starts picking up oxygen, and then right here, it's fully oxygenated. And so it goes back into the system, and the oxygen-rich blood goes back in. Oxygen-poor is what's coming in, and oxygen-rich is what's leaving. So that's a counter-current exchange. Water goes one way, blood flows the other. And one more picture of it. You can see this gradient 100% to 15, 5 to 90. They flow opposite. What it does is it maintains a diffusion gradient um, over that whole length. So it doesn't just transfer at one point and then it's done. Um, it continues to transfer the whole time. So it maximizes that oxygen transfer. Gas exchange on land. Uh, there are many advantages of terrestrial life, such as air has got a lot of advantages. There's a lot more oxygen in it than there is in water, um, as far as the concentration is concerned. Uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide diffuse much faster through the air, um, so those respiratory surfaces that are exposed to air don't have to be ventilated as much as gills do. And air is lighter and easier to pump, so you um, expend less energy taking the air in and out. Disadvantages, uh, you have to keep large respiratory surfaces very moist, so you get a lot of water loss. Um, and you can reduce that water loss by keeping lungs internal. That's why our lungs are internal. Alright, some terrestrial adaptations. So here's our grasshopper. We talked about the spiracle. So it's like a little hole, almost oh, an opening on there with trachea tubes. And they got this air sac and such. Um, so trachea are tubes that branch throughout the body. And that gas is exchanged by diffusion, diffusion across moist cells that line terminal ends not through an open circulatory system. The mechanics of breathing. All right, air enters the nostrils. So that's your nasal cavity. And then it's filtered by hairs where it's warmed and moistened. Um, so it starts warming up and getting uh, a little moisture into it. And it's also sampled for odors, obviously we smell things. Okay, so from the nasal cavity, it goes to the pharynx, which is your the back of your throat, and the glottis, um, where it's choosing between which direction to go. The larynx, um, that's your voice box. Then your trachea, that's the windpipe. Then to a fork in the road, where it chooses either the left or right bronchi. Then to the bronchioles. And then, finally, to the alveoli, the air sacs. Um, now, these are all lined with epithelial lining, which has cilia, the little hair-like structures that stick out, that increases surface area, and a thin film of mucus. So that mucus traps dust, pollen, and particulates. And then the cilia move the mucus upward. Alright, so epiglottis is a flap of skin that covers your trachea so no food gets in when you eat. The trachea has cartilage rings that keep the air passage open and helps it maintain shape. It's lined with cilia, those little hair-like things, and that carries foreign particles away from the respiratory tract. And the bronchi also has cartilage rings that help to maintain shape, and they continue to divide into smaller and smaller branches. Alveoli. They do gas exchange across a thin epithelium of millions of alveoli. So here, here we go. Air comes in. This is our bronchiole. Air comes in. This is an alveolus. Um, it's got millions of alveoli. And uh, here's a capillary. So this is our circulatory system interacting with our respiratory system. Um, so the total surface area of that thin epithelium of al alveoli is about 100 meters squared. And it's only one cell thick, covered by a thin film of water, so for that diffusion, surrounded by capillaries, surrounded by capillaries. So that thin film of water causes the diffusion system. 
All right, so we'll see passive diffusion in alveoli. Um, oxygen dissolves into the water lining and diffuses across the cells into the bloodstream. So um, the oxygen from the respiratory system, the blood is deoxygenated, so it has a lower concentration, so the blood easily diffuses over. Same for carbon dioxide. The blood has more carbon dioxide in it than the, um, than the alveoli do, so the carbon dioxide easily um, moves over to the alveoli. All right, how do you transport oxygen? Uh, it's mainly transported by hemoglobin in red blood cells. That transports 97% of it. And plasma fluid transports 3%. And that uh, binds uh, in oxygen-rich. And um, oxygen and hemoglobin dissociate in oxygen-poor tissues. So they have a perfect system. Um, carbon dioxide, it enters red blood cells and combines with water and forms bicarbonate ions. Um, it could leave the capillaries and enter the lungs, or it could mix with plasma, um, or it can be put back into the alveoli and sent out of uh, the respiratory system. All right, diffusion of gases, we talked a little bit about this. Here's your lower O2, higher O2, it's gonna go this way. Lower, higher CO2, lower CO2, it's gonna go this way. So it's same thing. Capillaries in the lungs and in the muscles, um, that's, so it takes it in in the lungs and gives it off into the muscles. And the concentration and pressure is what drives the movement of gases. All right, hemoglobin, why do we use a carrier molecule? Well, oxygen isn't soluble enough in water for animal needs. It doesn't mix well enough. So blood alone could not provide enough oxygen to the animal cells. Um, and so it reversibly binds the O2. So it loads oxygen in the lungs and unloads it at the cells. So it binds and then unbinds. Carbon dioxide, like we said, it turns into bicarbonate. And then in the lungs, there's that lower CO2 pressure. Um, so the CO2 diffuses out of blood into the lungs and then we breathe it out. So the lungs. Um, their interior is a spongy texture and it's honeycombed with moist epithelium. So this is where we're at, this epithelium in here. Um, it's that exchange surface of um, air and um, of oxygen and carbon dioxide, um, but it creates a risk because it's an entry point for the environment into the body because you're breathing in the environment right here. And so all sorts of things could get diffused through and then uh, potentially wreak havoc in your system. All right, breathing. So now the mechanics of breathing. So that was all um, the science of diffusion and such. And now just the mechanics. Um, it's literally just a pressure change. So here's your diaphragm. If you inhale, the diaphragm contracts, the muscles pull tighter and so it pulls it down. That makes the lungs larger, and as the lungs are larger, they'll have a lower pressure than the air, than the environment outside. And so this air will want to move into the lower pressure region. And so you'll easily pull that air in as you breathe. And then when you exhale, the diaphragm relaxes and lets the muscles move back. So they move back to their space, makes the lungs smaller, and it pushes the air out. Higher pressure in here, lower pressure outside, moves to the area of lowest pressure. All right, uh, inspiration is taking oxygen in, and expiration is letting CO2 out. Finally, the respiratory rate is controlled by chemoreceptors. So if your blood pH decreases, then those chemoreceptors send impulses to the diaphragm um, and the intercostal muscles, and that increases the rate. It says breathe, and so your body makes you breathe. So you don't have to think about it. Your body is programmed to breathe for you. Isn't that wonderful? That's it for respiratory systems.